reading of the New Earth Mythology, Part 1, The Invasion of Heaven, read by the author Michael B. Kep. The Invasion of Heaven was recorded at Round Door Studios during February and March of 2013. The sessions were engineered by Amon Nother and produced by Will Dreamly Arts. The music composed and recorded by Carrie R. Bear. Cover art for the audio edition is by Michael B. Kep. For a print or ebook version of The New Earth Mythology Part 1, The Invasion of Heaven, please visit www.michaelbkep.com. And now, Part 1 of the New Earth Mythology, The Invasion of Heaven. The Invasion of Heaven, Part 1 of the New Earth Mythology. The artist needs no religion beyond his work. Albert Hubbard. Reality is frequently inaccurate. Douglas Adams. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in our philosophy. William Shakespeare. Prologue. This is really happening, isn't it? Psychologist Locke Neuwirth, a 37-year-old man in an olive green wool coat, blue jeans, and leather hiking boots, walks with his head down. He is crying. His breath steams in the October chill. The wooded trail blurs before him as he hikes toward a high cliff above Upper Priest Lake. Through the trees, the afternoon is gray and pale. He can hear the wind above the pines and water rushing against the stones below. He tries to pretend that what has happened is not real. He wishes that he had seen it coming. His mentor, friend, and fellow psychologist Marcus Reardon told him once, when a client of yours takes their own life, you'll want to take your own. You'll believe that it was your fault. And I assure you, after that, there's no going back. Locke brushes at the tears and leans into the hill, upping his pace. Damn you, Marcus, he says quietly. Damn you. His mind replays every session he had with Bethany. Bethany Winship, mid-sixties, fit and healthy, with a husband and grown children, convertible BMW, hot tub, and an expense account. As a girl, she learned to disappear, become invisible, hide. It was a necessary choice after the first time her whiskey-eyed father cracked his belt across her face and thighs. Being unnoticed became habit, and the better she got at it, the more she was forgotten, neglected. She shouldered all those memories into adulthood, into her marriage, and into her children until her strength gave out. Locke sees her pleading eyes, the streaks of black mascara, the remnant of a woman tormented by severe depression, each day falling deeper into darkness. Locke struggles to quiet her voice echoing in his memory torrents of unmet desires, missed chances, and fear. My life wasn't supposed to be like this, she had said. I wish I could redo it, have another chance, rewrite it. Locke wishes that too. He wishes that he had asked more questions, offered more encouragement, reached further. But now she's gone. There are three fears that every psychologist will face at some point. Another of Marcus Reardon's dictums, what he calls the three heavy what-ifs. What if I can't help them? What if I can't handle it? What if I go in with them? As this thought occurs to Locke, he feels his failure with Bethany as complete. The tears blind and burn lines down his cheeks. What if I can't help? He had done everything within his power to guide Bethany out of the dark. In the end, it was as if he had done nothing. What if I can't handle it? This is suddenly obvious, as he sees himself stumbling along the trail, crying uncontrollably, 
unable to put his emotions into some kind of order. Long hikes have always balanced him, brought clarity. Today, it's not working. Each tottering step approaches the edge of a black and swirling maelstrom. He is descending. He is going in with her. Locke stops suddenly, squeezes his eyes shut. He breathes. A distant boat engine drones and fades away toward the thoroughfare. A cluster of birds launch from the treetops above him. The water laps the shore. Then the sound of his wife's voice in his memory. I don't know how much more of this I can take, she had said. Her angry eyes flashed. I need a few days, he told her. I need some time to work out what has happened. She lowered her arms. Here's what will happen. You'll lose me, she said. I can't go on like this, with you, like this. Jesus, Locke, you need time, I need time. Locke's four-year-old son, Edwin, stood in the open door a few feet away. His hands balled into fists. Helen, Locke said, one of my clients has died. This is a lot for me to process, and I've just received more news. He remembers feeling for the envelope in his coat. News that will change. I'll tell you what needs to change, Locke. It's you. It's always something with you, she said, turning away. So where will you go? I don't know, Helen. I'm so sorry. There is so much more to this that I can't tell you right now. It's become much more serious. They think you did it. They think you... She faced him and watched. Locke felt the air leave his lungs. Yes, I am suspect. Helen turned her back. The conversation was over. He tried to pull her into an embrace. She pushed him away. Locke then knelt and held his son for a moment. I'll see you before you know it he remembers saying to him, before you know it. Locke starts walking again. Not far ahead, the steeper incline leads out of the trees. He reaches into his coat pocket and pulls out the bright red envelope the post had delivered to his house in Sagal, Idaho, two days ago. He stares at it as he walks. He reads the script on the front again, scribbled in Bethany's hand. Dr. Newarth, open only if something bad happens to me. He considers pulling the letter out and reading it again, but he shakes his head and pushes it back into his pocket. His jaw is clenched. He could tell no one about the letter, not yet, not even Helen. The slope rises steadily into a rocky clearing. He squints coming under the steel wash of sky. The icy breeze freezes his tears. He crosses the short distance to the cliff edge and stops. I've one chance, he thinks, looking quickly at his hands, still blotched with oil paint, crimson and black. One chance to change what has happened. I will lie to reveal the truth. He stares out across Upper Priest Lake. It looks small below him, wreathed into ash green, flecks of yellow tamarack like candles in shadow. I will lie to reveal the truth. A moment later, the air stills and all hushes to silence. The wind stops like holding breath. There's no longer the sound of water lapping below. No whisper in the trees, no bird call or faraway boat engine whining away to the south. Only his heart thrumming in his ears. The water shines below him like a metal plate, its surface motionless, a still membrane of glass reflecting the gray canopy above, so clear it looks as if there is a hole in the earth. Skywater. The sight nudges the darkness away from Locke's thought as he gapes down the sheer fifty-plus foot drop, mesmerized by the heavens he sees below him. His knees weaken, a weird sense of vertigo. Then suddenly he feels as if he is being watched, that he is not alone. He turns and looks behind to the shadow beneath the boughs. He scans the tree line and along the trail that leads down toward the beach. Nothing. No one. Locke faces downward again, the small lake far below staring back up at the sky, at itself. Something moves in the water. 
round, welling out, a black spot widening, a pooling stain at its center. But this can't be. It moves, flitting, searching. Locke steadies himself and rubs his eyes, unsure of what he is seeing. Looking again, the massive dot is ringed with an ice-blue iris, its pupil dilating ever wider. It stares, it sees, then it looks at Locke. This is really happening, isn't it? Locke New Earth is midair. He thinks several thoughts all at once. He wonders if he was somehow yanked down over the edge. There is no lake surface below him now. It is an eye, hypnotic iris, gaping black center. It appeared as if a giant from a fairy tale had risen from beneath the world and pressed its eye to a peephole. Locke and the cold October sky mirrored in its glassy lens, and it pulled him down. Locke then wonders if he had instead thrown himself from the height when his mind managed to discern the anomaly, a massive eye seeing through him, inviting him like that connection that happens when the gazes of two strangers meet, that thrill of recognition in this isolated existence. He wanted to be a part of whatever it was that beheld him, so he jumped. Then, reason. He thinks that he may have merely tripped from the shock of such a sight, the impossibility of it, the terror. Slap. A thousand needles pierce his skin, a numb, slogging struggle, then more falling, head over foot, tumbling through a slow motion, bleary abyss. Silence. Flash. Gone. The stinging of his hands on gravel rouses him. His limbs are slow, weighted, sluggish. Gasping and clawing, he pulls himself up. With great effort, he lugs his heavy legs out of the cold water. He has the sense to know that hypothermia will set in soon, and it's a long hike back to the cabin. He totters to his feet and looks back across the water. The eye is gone, if there ever was one. A moment later, he is crashing through the brush along the lake shore, searching aimlessly for a landmark, a trail, a direction. He stumbles and falls at every few feet. He does not feel the gashes on his knees, but he sees the blood. Sharp, slashing branches scratch his face. A few more steps, another crash upon the stones. Before all goes black, he mumbles to himself a final, desperate assessment, over and over. I am Locke New Earth. This is really happening. This is really happening. Chapter 1 the water's eye. The black ink spreads open like a pupil in the dark. Locke New Earth presses the tip of his pen down into the last letter of his signature and holds it there. The fibers of the paper pull the pen's life into a widening eye. He stares at it. It stares back. 